I broke my hand on the set of The World's End. Afterwards, I went to see Morag, the set nurse, and she gave me two very powerful painkillers, which I took both of, and then she called me and said, just take one. That was a fun night. Spaced. Yeah, that was my first kind of lead role in a sitcom. Tim was a kind of extension of who I was at the time, a bit of a sort of uh, sci-fi geek comic book fan. Uh, I wrote the series with Jessica Hines, who played Daisy, who is an incredibly uh, gifted uh, actress and writer. Together we sort of came up with this flat share sitcom and got all our friends to be in it. And it was the first time, the second time actually, we worked with Edgar Wright, where I really formed my creative partnership with Edgar. The first time, um, I played Tim Bisley. I was required to kill a whole bunch of zombies. And uh, we shot the zombie sequence one morning. I was a little bit hungover, I seem to remember. Um, the idea was that Tim had done so much speed that he was hallucinating that he was actually in the video game he was playing, which is Resident Evil 2. <laughs> You want a piece of me? Come get some. And um, it was after that morning of shooting that we decided we would quite like to make a zombie film. And that zombie film was Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead was our first feature film, mine and Edgar, and I played the part of Sean Smiley Riley, as his name was, you probably didn't know that. That was his DJ name. Uh, he was a, um, an electrical store retail chap who was stuck in a sort of cycle of torpor and inactivity with his best friend Ed, much to his girlfriend's sort of disapproval. That really at the time was fairly autobiographical. Nick and I, Nick Frost and I, who played Ed, were ensconced in a pub in Highgate called The Shepherds, where we spent much of our time to the um, disappointment of our then girlfriend, Edgar Wright, who used to try and get us to go into town and go to the Groucho Club and places like that where celebrities hung out. But we didn't want to do that. We wanted to stay in the pub. And my girlfriend at the time, Maureen, who is now my beautiful wife of 13 years, she um, also was trying to get us to leave. And we didn't want to. So we wrote a whole film about it and added zombies. When we came up with the idea for Sean, um, we wanted him to stay in the same costume for the whole movie. Um, apart from the sort of first scene and the last scene. So we came up with this very, very distinctive white shirt, red tie, which became his look. And now every Halloween I get sent pictures of people who dress in that costume because it's actually quite an easy Halloween costume to replicate. It's just a white shirt with short sleeves and a red tie covered in blood and you're Shaun of the Dead. Hot fuzz. Uh, in Hot Fuzz, I played the part of Nicholas Angel, who was a very dedicated police officer, very by the book, not a maverick. He was the opposite of the classic action movie hero in that he did everything straight down the line. And during the process of the film, he learns to essentially dumb down and become more like an action hero. For Nicholas Angel, I had to kind of um, do a little bit more research. Sean was basically me, but Nicholas Angel was very, very much not me. I had to go and do some research with the police and hang out with cops, you know, research procedure and all that kind of stuff. A few drive uh, drive-alongs. Um, we um, put the blues and twos on a couple of times and went screaming around and then turned them off and then were told not to tell anyone that we did that. No. We were lucky enough to be in the car one time when there was a domestic in the West Country and not, it wasn't lucky that the domestic happened obviously, but there was a big argument in some house and a lot of noise. We got there with the blue lights flashing and, and were careening down some, some alleyways in the West Country, which was enormous fun. Uh, and fortunately, nobody was hurt. It was just a dispute over a tractor. Ever since, I've had a nodding relationship with most British police officers. You know, usually the Bobby is seen as a sort of slightly parochial character, when in actual fact, you know, we thought it was time the British Bobby got a, um, a cool representative. Most of the police that I encounter, if not all, seem to be slightly grateful for that because we weren't really taking the piss. We were actually kind of making a sort of tribute pick. So um, I've been let off so many murders because of Hot Fuzz. The world's end. Gary fucking King is my favorite character I've ever played. Gary is a lost soul, a warrior in the name of something completely pointless. He was a complex character in that Gary comes across as being very annoying at first and, and irritating and, and not someone you particularly like because he seems, seems selfish at the expense of his friends. But you learn as the film goes on that there's a lot more to him than that and he's actually, you know, beset by complications. How can you tell when you're drunk if you're never sober? I don't want to be sober! <laughs> It never got better than that night. That was supposed to be the beginning of my life. When the truth of him is revealed, you kind of slightly understand with more clarity um, why he behaves the way he does. 
Mission Impossible 3, Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation, and Fallout. Benji Dunn. Benjamin Disraeli Dunn. That's not his name, I just made that up. I got a call once from this guy, JJ Abrams. I don't know what happened to him, but he called me at my office and I was writing Hot Fuzz at the time and literally said, hey, do you want to come and be in Mission Impossible 3? And I said, all right, then why not? I'll give it a go. He had a big future, that guy. I remember looking at him and thinking, you got something. You're going to go somewhere. I don't know where he went. It's weird. I think I saw him in LA last time I was there. I was shooting in Skid Row and there was a box with JJ written on it. And um, I lifted the lid and there he was, skulking in the background of this little box. He was just wearing a pair of white underpants and they were very grubby. And I said, JJ, it's me, Simon, you remember from Mission Impossible 3? But he was gone. He was too far gone. He gave, at least he gave me the opportunity to play Benji for the first time and subsequently three more times in Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation and Fallout. Benji was a sort of lab technician who um, I think got a taste for adventure in Mission Impossible 3. He ends up being Ethan's GPS when he's in Shanghai. Okay, go down left. Left? I'm going left. Good, good. It's in the second building on your left. The signal bearings plus or minus three meters from the northeast corner. And I think that the thrill of that, the thrill of, of sort of being a bit naughty and going rogue with Ethan gave him the taste for adventure. And so he enrolled in the field agent program. And then when Ethan gets out of Russian prison in Ghost Protocol, there's Benji in the field. And that's like seeing that kid from IT who fixed your computer yesterday suddenly with you in the mine or whatever you're doing for a living. I don't know why you'd be in a mine. So it's been really fun playing um, Benji because he's sort of changed over the years. He's become more and more adept and more and more capable. But at the same time, he's still that wide-eyed, wet behind the ears kind of new guy. And for that reason, he's sort of the audience's way into these crazy adventures. Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, Star Trek Beyond. Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott. Scotty is such an iconic character and that's not anything to do with me. That's to do with James Doohan who um, brought the character to the screen in the first place and made him such a beloved sort of um, feature within the Star Trek TV series and latterly the movies. I was very lucky enough to be offered the role of Scotty by the guy JJ again. I was able to take part in Star Trek and eventually got to write, co-write a Star Trek film with a guy called Doug Jung, who was a, he became my dear friend. Um, in the trenches of writing a Star Trek film in six months is what we had to do. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I love playing Scotty. A lot of people say my accent's terrible. Uh, I'd like to say it's not. It's actually okay. But people like to be passive aggressive towards strangers because their lives are so empty. So, you know, have at it. Wait, no, hang on a minute, Lassie. I'm having a difficult day here. I've got to find my crewmates. You help me and I help you. All right, well, things being as they are, I doubt I'll get a better offer today, so lead the way. My wife is Scottish, as such, so is half my family. So they all help me out with my accent and teach me words to say like scunner and you wee clatty bastard and things like that. So um, that's really good fun, having some authenticity, despite what mainly English people will say, oh, your Scottish accent is rubbish. But most of the Scottish people I encounter are like, hey, well done, lad, you did well. So um, I love them for that. I love the Scots more than the English. Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs and Collision Course. I play the character of Buck the Weasel, who is a one-eyed weasel, which uh, is also often a euphemism for a man's parts. It's not a euphemism for my part, because my part was actually Buck the Weasel, who um, was trapped in a prehistoric ice cave for many years uh, with a group of dinosaurs in Ice Age Dawn of the Dinosaurs, and then came topside for Ice Age Collision Course to help the Ice Age gang, Manny, Diego, that lot, avoid a collision with a massive asteroid. I love playing Buck, he's a, he's a crazy sort of ball of energy. You'd be surprised to know how exhausting it is to play him even though I'm only in a room with a microphone a lot of the time. I've never met Ray Romano or Queen or any of those guys. I met Dennis Leary once when I was younger but he won't remember that. And yet we've had all these adventures together and that's the strange thing about doing voiceovers is that you sometimes, or generally always, do it solo. One day I'll, I'll get to meet those guys and we'll reminisce about the great times we had together. But until then, and it's not going to happen. Paul. In Paul, I play the character of Graham Willey, who is the friend and wingman of Clive Gollings, uh, played by Nick Frost, my longtime friend and collaborator. Graham and Clive are two nerds in the real sense of the word, not in the new sense where everyone's a nerd just because they go and watch Iron Man. And Clive and Graham are both big sci fi fans. Clive's an author, Graham is an illustrator. They go to Comic-Con and then they take a little pilgrimage out to the black mailbox at Area 51 in Nevada. When they get there, they happen to run into an alien uh, on the run. 
and they help him get back to his ship. It's like a wish for film for nerds, really. Paul was played by Seth Rogen. He's an entirely CG character, beautifully brought to life by Double Negative. I become a father in Paul, and you can look out for this if you like. On the scene where we knock on Tara's door, and she opens the door, in the interim between us knocking and her opening, I went back to Los Angeles and uh, was present for the birth of my daughter, and then went back to film the rest of the scene. So when I watch the movie, I see myself become a father in a single edit, and it's, uh, it's a remarkable little moment for me when I watch that film, which I do every week, because I love it so much. Star Wars The Force Awakens. Star Wars The Force Awakens is a film in a series of movies which began in 1977 with Star Wars A New Hope, as it was called a year after it came out, and then Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, The Phantom something, Attack of the Things, and Revenge of something. And then there was another one, and it's this. And in that I play Ankar Plutt, who is essentially like a scrap metal merchant. And Ankar was an interesting role for me because it was fully um, synthetic suit, fat suit, silicon mask with CG augmented features. It was a tough call because I was in the deserts of, of Abu Dhabi in 50 degree heat and then in Pinewood Studios in similar heat because we were in a studio. But it was great, and it was great to play such an important part in the Star Wars universe. And I hope I'm not spoiling it for anyone to say that Ankar Plot in the episode nine will become something of a significant character. And um, he is actually the Force, and as such means more, I think, than any other Star Wars character, particularly Hans, Olo, or um, Tudor Bakken, or uh, Luke Scrapwalker. Ready Player One. I love any chance I get to work with Steven Spielberg. He is a fantastic director and a wonderful man, and um, it's someone who shaped my love of cinema and films generally. So, yeah, to get to play Ogden Morrow was a treat. Ogden Morrow was the co-creator of The Oasis with James Halliday, who was played by Mark Rylance. I got to play Ogden at various stages in his life, as a young man, as a middle-aged man, as an old man as well. And that was really good fun, because I got to go in to, to have aging makeup, and uh, that took about five hours. But it was really fun to, to look in the mirror and see myself as an old man, uh, which I do every day these days, but um, as an even older man, let's say, and also do my old man walk, which is to put my hand just here and then walk a little bit like this. I like to watch old men walking. It's one of my favorite pastimes. Often I'll get a nice position in the park, uh, put a rug down, get some sandwiches and just watch old men walking around. It's quite easy to do because a lot of them are partially sighted. So sometimes I'll pursue them for up to two or three miles if they can make it that far and video them walking. And I have a large library of uh, old men walking around, um, which I watch in the evenings as I'm um, having my dinner. For me, it's always about the money and how much they're gonna pay me to be in these films. No, I, I, you know, I mean, you look for complexities in characters, you look for layers and interesting sort of subtext. I love a character who has something going on inside, which you have to communicate in subtle ways. 